All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to be interviewing Coach Mason from Insight Soccer Training based in Colorado. And what we're going to do is have Mason share his story about kind of how he started. And this is ideal for you if you're watching, you're a coach that wants to start or you want to grow your business. Uh, I think Mason will give you some good insight <laughs> on how he did this. Um, so Mason, tell us, like, when you think about when you started your coaching journey, like, what kind of made you get into coaching and just kind of give your backstory of when you first start out coaching? Yeah, so I was a, a player um, all the way up, you know, from three years old until high school. And as a smaller player, I had a lot of uh, growth problems in my knees. Um, and I actually had a surgery in high school and the head coach reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to be the team manager? Um, so although I would have rather been playing, um, I, I ended up being the team manager that first year or my, my final senior year and got into more coaching when it came to uh, college. So I, I, once I recovered from my knee surgery, I, I played in college, but I also coached middle school boys. Um, and as soon as I graduated, I, I got back into it, uh, back into coaching and, and ended up coaching for the club that I grew up playing for, um, and, and have been doing it ever since. So gotcha. very cool. So with that middle school boys team, like the first thing I thought of when you said that, that was kind of the first group I started with, um, uh, how challenging was that when you, when you coached them? Uh, you know, it was really, it was really tough. And I think the biggest challenge just in that specific instance, uh, in Iowa, youth soccer is not as big as it is in a lot of other states. So what you had were exceptional athletes uh, whose first sports were, were football and basketball. So when we played to other teams, it was a really ugly game, but it was, it was fast paced. And uh, the, the kids really were, gifted athletically so teaching them a, a different game and trying to implement technical skills was was a real challenge but uh, it was a blast watching them right yeah it's funny I, the team that I was coaching was in Springfield Missouri and uh it would be hilarious there'd be like three kids that would show up to practice <laughs> I felt like I was doing like small group training with a with a club <laughs> yeah um, but yeah it was I think that it made me realize how to be more patient mm. um, because I, I, in my head, I was like, you know what? I, I want to train kids who are really serious, but that just wasn't the case there. Um, and then I know when I moved back to Texas, it was just a different type of environment. Um, but when you started coaching the club that you're at, like, was there a big shift as far as how serious the players were in that setting versus the, the middle school team that you had? Yeah, I, I would say so. So when I got back and started coaching club, I, I ended up coaching uh, girls. Uh, so that was, that was a big change. I had not coached girls prior to coaching at the club uh, level. And I found that there were girls that were serious um, and they were, you know, trying to make a competitive team. And also the parents were far more serious. Uh, mm -hmm. Really in Iowa, the parents couldn't care less whether uh, their kid was winning or not. And um, at the club level, you know, the, the parents really want to see growth and development. Uh, and they also want to see their kids win some tournaments, you know? Right. Right. Do you feel like girls soccer is a lot more popular in your area than boys soccer? Uh, no, I'd say they're pretty even uh, across the board in Denver. Some clubs are known for taking girls soccer more seriously. Mm -hmm. um, whereas others, you know, the, they're like, Oh, the focus is only on boys. So, uh, it's kind of a difference between clubs, but not by area so much. Right. Yeah. It's pretty crazy here. There's a, there's a one club in particular. I went out to their tryouts. I don't know if I told you this before, uh, but I went to their tryouts and they had boys on like a couple of fields and then they had girls on uh, a few fields. And for one age group, uh, they had six different girls teams. And these, these were sophomores in high schools. And for the boys, they just had one. Wow. 
And here, I don't know, it's, it's, it's almost like girls have taken it way more serious. Parents have taken it more serious. They're more committed, just like you said. Uh, but yeah, there's, I don't know why it's like, there's this huge drop off with boys once they get to like 14, 15, 16, and then girls, it just gets bigger and bigger. Um, and so you've been coaching, like, since you started, have you been consistently coaching girls like with, with that club? I have. Uh, so right now I have two teams, uh, one boys team and one girls team. Um, but I don't think there's been a season that I haven't coached girls. Um, lots of staff training with boys teams, but, um, mostly on on the girl side. Gotcha. So how many years have you been coaching at that club total? Uh, I've been coaching there five, five years now. Gotcha. All right, cool. Very cool. And I know, I know this people who are watching don't know this yet, but, um, you started, you wanted to start your own training business. So when did you, when did you originally start that? So I started doing a few private trainings back at the end of 2017, uh, but it wasn't until 2018 that I established uh, my business as an LLC and uh, started designing the training sessions a little more seriously. Gotcha. And what made you, I guess, what made you want to start your, your own business? Uh, you know, it had to be that everyone was doing what I was doing. So they were kind of just taking players out and kicking the ball around with them. Uh, but I, I didn't see any improvement that way. And I didn't see improvement in the players that were doing that with either their parents or coaches that maybe gave up a little bit of their time, but didn't put a lot of thought into sessions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I created the business because I wanted to sort of formalize the process and I wanted to make sure that players could track their development. Right. right? So, um, and I, I also saw that it, it was a different thing than the big camps, right? So a lot of these coaches are, are taking um, players in groups of anywhere from 10 to, you know, 100. Uh, uh, yeah, 100 players. And, right. and, they're, and they're doing these technical things with them. Um, and that, that's all uh, great, but um, I've said it before, it, it makes a great option for parents who want to, you know, get their kids away from the house for about six hours when they're working. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, I think insight provides something different. Uh, than right. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's more what you do. It's more personalized mm-hmm. and ultimately it's a, it's a far superior product than a parent taking their kid, dropping them off with a thousand kids that are going to be just running around or standing there doing nothing. And, and, it's really cool, man. Cause you saw, ultimately you solved a problem, right? You saw that there's a lot of people kind of doing the same, same old thing. And that's been happening for decades. I remember when I was a kid, some of the camps I went to, like, it would just be, we'd play a world cup the whole time. And it's like, I mean, it's fun, but you can't get better doing that. Uh, right. And and it's cool to see though, like you, you saw something that was going on you're like, you know what, like, I'm just gonna, I'm going to make this like a, a good product and a good service. And that's why you've been successful with what you're doing. And, um, like, what do you specialize in? Do you do a lot of one-on-one training or group training or both? Yeah, I do a lot of one-on-one training. I'd say that's the majority of, of what I do. Um, I have another coach that does that as well. Uh, in, in terms of small groups, I'll do small groups, but I, I don't go over four typically mm-hmm. unless I'm preparing a team for a 3v3 tournament and then it's six. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, that's not a rule. It's, it's kind of an exception. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I find that the smaller the number, the higher quality the training is. Uh, yes. two, is two is usually really excellent. Uh, one is great. But, you know, getting up to, you know, nine – some coaches have groups of nine. I find they're just putting them in a line and having them go back and forth. And that's the entire session, right? You right. Don't, you don't get beyond that. So. Right. Yeah. It was funny. The other day I was talking to a coach and, and I was asking him uh, if he does one-on-one training or group training. He's like, yeah, I do small group training. And I was like, okay, cool. Like how many kids are in it? He was like, yeah, we have like around 30. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just every, everyone. And that's the thing. Everyone thinks of it in a different way. Um, 
And I know like when I've run clinics in the past, like my favorite clinics I ever did, there'd be like 10 players only. And it'd be like me and one other coach. And that's just, that's the, the type of quality that I always look to bring to sessions is I, I don't want there to be too many kids there because I know the quality can drop off. But there are coaches that, you know, they, they can have a great session with a lot of kids. And I think if they have more coaches there, it, it makes the session better. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, so you focus in on one-on-one and group training, uh, small group training. And yeah. I know you mentioned you like to kind of track and measure results with kids. Like how much easier do you feel like it is seeing results with a client when you're working with them one-on-one versus the team setting? I, I mean, I find it, it's more work. I would say, uh, because you have to put in the time and effort to go watch that player play. Um, But I find that, you know, rather than coaching a team, if I'm going to watch a a player play one or two matches and I've never seen anybody else play, uh, you know, my focus is on that player. It's not on the tactics uh, Mm -hmm. of of the team as a whole. It's not on other players. Um, It's, it's for that player. And so the parents like that because they feel like, you know, they're getting the attention that their son or daughter deserves. Um, And I feel like I can hone in on what that player needs for our next sessions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's why people like specifically parents who are competitive, they want, they not only want, but they need their child to have more personalized help. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like, I feel like it's like that with everything. Um, the more personalized it is, the, the faster it is to learn, the easier it is to get results. And Mm -hmm. from your experience, like, I'm just going to take the age group of, you know, U10 girls to U14 girls, like that type of age group. Like, what do you think is the biggest obstacle girls that are that age face? Like when it just comes down to soccer? Uh, You know, I I feel like it's different with, every player and you can have these profiles right where some players have different challenges than others the one that's most that's most common is probably confidence i think Mm -hmm. a lot of girls that age struggle with confidence and i know there are uh, some really excellent online programs Um, i've provided my own online program for building confidence Uh, at least that's one of the big topics we focus on um yeah and you know often that's not a problem with boys. Uh, It's more of a problem that I I see with girls is the confidence issue. Uh, I will say that the reason one-on-one training works really well with that is because each girl comes out of having confidence. They learn it differently. Right. You know, so being able to approach uh, the different learning styles and developing that confidence looks different in each player. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's, I'll say that's one of the biggest things I've learned about training kids is like every kid is so different. Mm -hmm. If I say something to a player um, that has never trained with me before, and I say the same thing to someone who's been with me for a while, they will take it two completely different ways. Um, And every kid out there that I, I, that I've worked with, like I've always looked back and, and I know like just as a coach, every single thing that comes out of your mouth, like it's going to stick with them. And, and when you talked about the confidence to me, like, I, I know that has been the most glaring problem, um, especially with girls that are that age. And it's good though, that you've taken the steps to create your own type of program to help um, kids transform their, con- uh, their confidence, because if they don't have that, that's where, Soccer, it, it's one of those things where it's like kids can just go through the motions. Like they get in this, the routine of showing up to club practice, training twice a week, showing up to the games. And um, if they're scared of their coach or they're afraid to make mistakes, or I mean, I could list a million different reasons why they struggle with confidence. Like if that doesn't go away, then that's just going to carry with them into their adult life. <laughs> um, and I see that's very common with, with adults that 
you know, probably never learned that sort of stuff when they were younger, like uh, that stays with you forever. So it's, it's cool to see that you're creating something and you have something that is not going to just help them within soccer, but it's going to carry over into their personal life, you know, as they grow up, which I feel like, especially now, like, I mean, we're in August of 2020. You just think about the lack of, uh, leadership just f from everyone. Like it's, like no matter what side you're on politically it's like right we we need like more mentally tough people <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and ultimately that's what you're doing that that's really cool and so so i want to see if you can try to share like what when you started your business mm -hmm. like what was the biggest challenge that you feel like you faced like what was the hardest thing for you well i guess the biggest thing is differentiating a boutique business, or uh, sometimes I call it like a slow business from a camp, right? So a, a lot of parents would say, well, can't I just throw them in this camp? I was like, well, you could, right? I mean, it's not something that's going to be bad for their development. Camps are never, I grew up doing all kinds of camps, MLS camps, you know, mountain soccer camps. Um, all, all the big camps were good for me, uh, but it's, it's a real challenge to say, um, you know, a supplemental training that's going to accelerate development. You know, we have one hour instead of six uh, right. is going is going to be this personal training. And there are things I can point out to uh, about your daughter's play, about her uh, mentality that are different than what a coach in one of those camps is going to be able to do. Um, some coaches prefer. Uh, I, I saw a you know, a social media post this morning. Some coaches prefer over five players. They're like, I really want to develop the team and, and team play and uh, tactical knowledge. And that's all great, but it, it does not address the mentality that players have when they execute um, this, this, in the same way. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's good though, because you're ultimately what you're doing is you're taking a stance in what you believe in. Mm -hmm. right and going yeah. down that niche and, and that's the thing most people when they start they don't do that they they think well i want to do one-on-one -on -one training i want to do group training i want to do camps and clinics and they try to do all this stuff but they're they don't specialize <clears throat> um same way like if if i had to get brain surgery right I'm not going to go down to, to the cattle rancher down the road and, and ask him for advice. Like I'm going to go to, to the brain surgeon and right. meet with someone who's a specialist. And that's why like when you take that stance that you've taken, it mm -hmm. attracts people who ultimately know that their kid does need more personalized help. And that does okay. separate you from anyone else um, who, who's, thinking on on the fence of oh well we want to do this big camp or we want to do this one-on-one -on -one training like that that draws in more people um now like this is one of those things i know for me i have a i have a bunch of stories like do you have any kind of crazy stories about dealing with a like someone that's hard to deal with as a client like someone who either didn't pay or they were always late or super uncommitted i can edit this out by the way like <laughs> um yeah sorry give me one sec here <laughs> you're pulling up your your google document of all the <laughs> all the stories <laughs> no so my my background screen is changing so i don't know if you noticed but it made my face like really bright and then it was like dark so yeah just trying to stop it from changing <laughs> uh okay there we go so you know one of the craziest actually i'm gonna I'm going to say like a common problem that I have is uh, kids that come in and they just, they're too good for their rec teams, but they don't care enough to be an above average player on their, whatever competitive team they're trying to make. So you, a lot of parents are like, my kid scored eight goals, you know, I, I want to make her better. And then I'm like, okay, can you juggle the ball more than twice? It's like, no, you know, he or she cannot do it. It's like, all right, this is something you need to work on. Right. Just 
on your own because you know you don't want to take I don't want to take my time just to teach you how to juggle with something you have to do on your own right well you know if it's five six weeks later and I find that child has not tried to improve their technical skills at all that I ask them to work on outside of that uh, I, I find they're not motivated, right? It's the parents yeah. that are motivated. Yeah. And so um, I'm actively trying to encourage those types of players to attend camps rather than personal training mm -hmm. because camps are going to benefit them far more than personal training will. Mm -hmm. yes. um, you know, and otherwise I will tell the parents straight up, uh, you know, I, I have plenty of clients. I don't um, need the business just for the sake of business your child would be best off learning at a camp uh, before they come to personal training. Right. And that shows, that shows a lot of strength and what, and confidence in what you do, because you know that like you want to train a very specific type of player. You're not, you're not just out there playing duck, duck goose for an hour. Right. right. And, and I know a lot of people do that. Um, and and I mean, if you, if you had to reverse engineer the whole process though, it's like when you have a player who's committed their discipline and they want to be there, their parents, it doesn't matter if their parents want them to be there or not, but the player wants to be there. Like, mm -hmm. and that player goes through, through your program. They're absolutely going to get better because they're meeting your expectations and like, you're going to be ready. You're going to be, you're going to have the plan. You know how to help them get better. And their training intensity will match what you do when it's the right type of player and right. kids that don't fall into that category. Hey, yeah, you're, you're, that's the best thing to do is recommend them to something else that, um, that is not what you do. Um, because ultimately it becomes this thing where you drive out to the sessions and you have this like splitting headache and you're like, I know that this kid does not want to be here today. Right. And, and then it makes the trainer go through the motions. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen that man with, with myself in the past, like there's been, there's been a lot of kids back in the day and I was too afraid to tell their parents like, Hey, this isn't a good fit anymore. Or, Hey, you guys are not a good fit. Now I absolutely do that. Um, so, so tell me like when you think about the, the challenges that you've had as far as, kind of separating what you do from camps and clinics, like at the beginning and you, you've already kind of made an established program for yourself. Like outside of that, like what, what other types of obstacles did you feel like you faced? Like, did you feel really confident charging parents? Did you feel confident just like running the business? Like when, when you were starting or were those things that you had to kind of learn and, and figure out as time went on? Yeah, those are all good questions. And I'd say there were two other main challenges. Uh, the first one was sort of the pricing. I, I would keep my, my rates really low. Um, and I think part of that was the fact that I grew up in a family that didn't have a lot of money. And so uh, private trainings were, you know, I had a few of them with some really excellent coaches. Um, one in particular who played for the Brazil under 20 team. Um, yeah, and he, he was a phenomenal personal trainer. He actually runs a uh, private training business out in Australia now. Um, cool. Yeah, great, great guy. Uh, but, you know, we could afford like one session once a year because he would charge a high price. Um, right. But, but, you know, I found that uh, there is a really big market for parents who are willing to put in the funds uh, as long as the training is really high quality. So that, that guy who trained me, he was, because he charged a high price, it was like, I would just uh, go to his session so excited because I knew that I was going to get something out of it and I want to provide the same thing. Right. Um, so, so that, that pricing was a little bit different, uh, initially when I started the business than it is now. Uh, now I have my rates uh, set and I, they're a little higher than they were. And I, you know, but I, will promise the parent quality training, uh, right. you know, and I have the experience, the coaching education to back that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the second challenge, uh, yeah, the second challenge I would say has a lot to do with 
not just reverting to uh, games. A lot of players just like to play games, um, but it's really getting kids to focus on, you know, things like the quality of their first touch, right? Rather than how many goals can I score? Mm -hmm. uh, because in a match, you know, you're not going to score a lot of goals. You're on a bigger field. Um, and so the quality of your first touch and the, the type of pass that you deliver, the little things like that, the details, mm. uh, those matter so much and getting that across to those kids, uh, it was a real challenge. So. Right. Yeah. And it's like that. I, I know like, if someone came to watch my sessions that I have with kids, I am so obsessed about the first touch mm -hmm. and like, I, I would say, and, and I never post any of my stuff on Instagram cause I don't, I don't really care to do that but like if someone watched my session for an hour they'd be like dude you guys do the same sort of stuff the whole time and i'm like yeah because I, I know that that's going to be the most important thing that they have to be able to do when they get in the game because yep and um and going back to what you said though about training with that guy from brazil like if you if we had to boil it down it's like the reason why that guy did that in the way he priced it that way, like he knew his quality was superior. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of coaches, they, they ask me, well, Ben, I want to start charging more. It's like, well, you know, that's, that's great. Everyone wants to charge more. Um, but like, is the quality in, of what you do, is that going to match the price? Is, is that going to exceed whatever the price is? Because whatever parents, pay like whatever they're investing they should be getting 10 times the amount of value like they should mm -hmm. feel even if they're paying a lot they should feel like wow this is really cheap mm -hmm. like they should be kind of guilty paying even if it's a high price they should they should have that feeling like wow training with mason like this is like we're not going to get this anywhere else and and i know like coaches that get more experience they start to have more self-belief that yeah you know i can charge more but it all comes down to that quality. And I, I would say that's a, that's a common mistake <clears throat> that I see a lot of coaches make is they want to just right out of the gate, start charging a lot. And it's like, well, you know, you need to prove it to yourself that it's going to work at a lower rate first. Um, mm -hmm. And then as you get more experience, you absolutely should charge more if you have a quality product. Um, right. Very cool, man. So I know when, when you kind of, when we were uh, introduced, like this was like right around when COVID started, right? Yeah. And I think you either watched one of my YouTube videos or you got an email. Um, but we worked one-on-one -on -one together uh, to help kind of set up some different processes with, within your business. Like mm -hmm. what do you feel like was the biggest kind of breakthrough uh, that you experienced after we worked together? Yeah, I'd say the biggest breakthrough was uh, that you were encouraging me to create an online program. Uh, so several coaches had told me, you know, like, you need to develop the cognitive aspect of the game, uh, which I can't do. I, I mean, I do change management uh, type stuff and learning and development in the corporate world. So I, I know how people think and um having coached for the years that I have, I know how kids learn. You know, I, I like to consider myself not just a good coach, but a good teacher. Uh, so that biggest breakthrough was probably creating that cognitive program, uh, coupled with a technical program that kids can do from home. Um, I was able to film a ton of videos myself since I've played for years uh, and, and sell those two together. And I think, I think that was, really well timed because I had called you and we had talked about this program and developed it. And then right at that time, development Academy was disbanded, right? There's, there's no more DA. So I had a lot of kids asking for that type of training and I was able to provide it through the sort of the online route. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if it was, uh, my timing was lucky. Um, but yeah, that process of, of creating that was phenomenally timed. Right. Yeah. And, and it's crazy. Like I've never said this on YouTube or podcast, but I mean, I'll tell you like during that time, 
like right when COVID hit, there was, uh, there's two types of coaches. It was someone who's like you, that's like, all right, I need to figure this out and I need to go online. And that's one of the reasons why I helped you. Um, and then there's other people who are like, well, I'm just going to like either wait it out or I'm not going to do anything. And a lot of those types of people did not take the time that you took um, to create something. And I, I saw like there's coach, some coaches in our mastermind that like, they just like right around March, they just like went into a mode of creating an online program. And a lot of those people, their businesses did so much better during that time. They were helping way more people during that time. And then the good thing about it though, is like with the, the timing I know is kind of crazy <laughs> um, with all of that, but now you have that as an asset for the future. Right. And, and I know before we got on here, we were talking about, you know, our kids going back to school in your area and stuff like that. Um, and it's like, we don't, we can't predict or know what's going to happen with schools or club soccer or with leagues or organizations. But mm -hmm. what you can control is what you can control, which is like creating that product, uh, creating that service and, um, and hats off to you, man, for, for doing that and following through. Cause I know a lot of people were very, very hesitant towards doing something like that just because they either a, they hadn't done it before or B, they did not think it would work or, or parents wouldn't buy it. Um, right. So, so that kind of, kind of shifts towards the, the next question I have here um, is like, I know the world cup is going to be here. What is it? 2026. Is that right? That's right. So where do you see, despite what's going on right now with, with COVID, like where do you see the future of one-on-one -on -one training? going like between now and the world cup. And I would say beyond the world cup, like what, where, where do you see that going coming up? Um, so do you mean in general or do you mean for the one-on-one -on -one training I do or? Uh, yeah, I'd say in general. Uh, you know, I think you're going to see a, a rise in one-on-one -on -one coaching. I mean, already if I head to the fields, I know there's a lot of other people doing, one-on-ones, uh, it's usually going to be a parent and their child. Uh, so, you know, my first goal is to make players better. It's not to uh, just make money. So sometimes I'll help out parents and say, here's what you need to do fundamentally to help your child get better. Mm -hmm. um, you're also going to see more, you know, small group trainings. Uh, inevitably with COVID, the numbers have shrunk. Um, the only tournament that I've been a part of since this whole thing hit was a three V three tournament. Uh, and there's probably far too many people at the tournament watching <laughs> right. very, very little social distancing. Um, but compared to a normal club run tournament, you know, it's at a far smaller scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to see an increase in more small group trainings. Uh, the, the difference is going to be the quality of those trainings, right? So that the, kid that's just kicking around um, is going to get better. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but the, the one who's working with a private coach to uh, figure out the intricacies and the details of what they need to improve, um, that might be the difference between making a top team and the second team or making a varsity team versus JV. Uh, so the future of one-on-one -on -one training is um, certainly there's going to be an increase in it. Um, I don't know if the overall quality is going to go up, but, uh, I'm committed to making that quality higher. Right. Yeah. And the way my, my approach on this has been, I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of laugh about it when I think of it, but you know, it was like when, when MySpace was really big and then Facebook just came in and just like demolished them. Uh, yeah. And then there was other type of social networks during that time that were trying to get, they were trying to make, make it big. Mm -hmm. And then since then, Facebook has just established itself as this company that is buying up all these other companies. Like they have the best people in the world working there. Like 
it's just a very dominant type of business. And I see kind of the same thing happening with one-on-one -on -one training. Like there's going to be so many people that get into it, which I think is going to be good, mm -hmm. but it goes back to the problem that you just said is like, just because there's a lot of people, that doesn't mean there's going to be high quality, right. but those who have the highest quality programs over the next six years in my head are going to be like the Facebooks in whatever city that they live in. And then everyone else is going to try to be competing against each other. And I do see though, like even despite what's going on right now, I see one-on-one -on -one training over the next six months just being massive. Cause like if kids are unable to train with their team or if there's no tournaments, there's all of this free time mm -hmm. now that parents have and kids have. And if you think just about the financial side, like, a lot of the money that parents would be investing into club soccer. Now they have that, that money to invest into a coach and a trainer. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I agree with you though. It's like, it's, I think it's going to get a lot bigger, but it's, it's going to feel very watered down, I think. And mm -hmm. then people who choose to have great programs are going to have great programs. And then, you know, other coaches I think are probably going to struggle um, to get clients because it's going to be hard to compete against someone who's really good like yourself. Um, yeah. Cool, man. So if someone was starting their business today, like let's say they're, they're watching this and they're like, man, like Mason has an awesome story. Like I, I'd, I'd love to do what he does. Like what would be kind of like the number one thing you would tell someone who's just starting their business like what would be the piece of advice you would give them that maybe you wish you had or just advice that you would want to give someone to encourage them to start? Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a, a sort of, I think business book, uh, by, I think it's a Seth Godin. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, he's, he's kind of a marketing guy. Uh, but he made this book called purple cow. Yeah. Right. And he's like on the road, you pass a ton of cows uh, if you're driving through the countryside, but like, what if you saw a purple cow, you know, like that, that would turn someone's head. Um, so my, my question is, what are you doing differently that other people are not, you know, what is, what is your purple cow? Uh, and for me, it's going to be number one, the, the quality of the training. I'm not going for, again, those high numbers of people. I, I don't really accept big numbers. If I had a team say, Hey, we want you to train our whole team. Our, our coach isn't doing much. I probably wouldn't do it. I would, you know, take those, that team and put them into small groups mm -hmm. uh, and tr train them separately. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, and it could be that you are, you have something different in your area. You have the purple cow just for your area and someone else might be doing that um, online, right. Or in a different location. Uh, you know, there's nothing really new under the sun, but there is usually something new and unique to your area. Right. Uh, so that's, that's the advice I would give is just to ask that question. Like, what are you doing that other coaches aren't? Right. Yeah. It's automatically that makes what you do stand out. It's, it is the purple cow. <laughs> it, right. It's different and it grabs people's attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's... And, Go, go for it. So, and I will say like the thing about a purple cow is you're going to have the naysayers, the people who uh, would like to put their son or daughter in, uh, you know, a camp or another coach uh, and say, Hey, th this is cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't really want to pay your prices. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I'll lower those. I'll give coupon codes and, and whatnot, but, for the most part, I say it's okay. Like I'm okay with the fact that I am not all things to all people or all things to all soccer players. Yes. Uh, and, and that's part of uh, having that purple cow is you're going to have the people who don't like your service. who don't like your product. Um, but, and, and I, th I think I've learned to be okay with that. And I would tell other coaches be okay with that, right? You're going to have those, those people who are going to challenge uh, your benchmarks and, and your, processes right yeah yeah there's been there's been a lot of times when in the past over the last 
12 years, I I've been on phone calls with parents. Um, and they were probably very used to paying a very low amount for one-on-one training or, um, or maybe they didn't know the investment and mm-hmm. we would get to that part of the call and I would tell them and like, there's, I've gotten so many different funny reactions, like, like, wow, that's way too much. Or wow. Are people really paying that? <laughs> um, like, and, and again, it goes back to what you said though. Like you have to have kind of thick skin and just know that what you have is not for everyone. Like you, it's just, it's impossible to make everyone happy. Um, mm-hmm. But when you believe in your product, you know, it's going to draw in the right people and they're going to be loyal and committed. And ultimately their kids are the ones who are going to get the results. Like, right. Cause they're not just buying like for your business. They're not, they're not buying soccer lessons. They're, they're buying uh, transformation and confidence. Right. A completely this, different market. Exactly. And this is why pay to play for us soccer has not worked very well because right. they're, doing it at the club level. Uh, but when it comes to private training, I do really believe that like what you pay is what you get for, right? Yeah. A lot of coaches will put in a mass amount of players and say, here's your low price. Uh, and then that's what they do. Um, as a boutique company uh, at Insight, uh, it's just not what I'm doing. I don't have the bandwidth uh, for that type of thing, but I'm invested in the individual player right. Or the small group of three that's that I'm training with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it kind of goes back to, um, I remember I, I had a mentor tell me this. He was like, when people pay more, they pay more attention. Yes. Like if someone pays a very little amount for something, they won't take it serious. And right. I mean, oftentimes when people don't take it serious, they're, they're just, they're not going to be into it. They're not going to want the result. Uh, mm-hmm. And they won't, they'll never be accountable. Um, and that's why, like, I mean, people can always choose, you know, do they want committed clients or not? Like the fastest way to get uncommitted clients is to charge a very little amount of money Mm -hmm. for a service. Um, awesome, man. Is there anything that you want to add to, uh, to what we talked about here or any other tips or advice you'd give anyone who's looking to start? Sure. Um, Yeah, just one bit of advice, and it's kind of one of the more recent challenges uh, that I've had, and that's with COVID. uh, You know, my club has asked that I, you know, volunteer time towards my teams, um, even without a contract. So I'm, you know, I might look like uh, a jerk by asking the directors, you know, when when is the contract going to come out? Because uh, it makes it sound like my priority is... Uh, money, right? And when I'm contracted by the club. Um, but I think it's important to note for coaches that are starting and make coach teams um, that you can stand by your principles uh, and your principles are determined by your priorities, right? So I'm going to prioritize uh, the individual player, especially um, if I'm not contracted. And that's just because uh, of where I place my priorities, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that I don't want to volunteer or whatever. Uh, But yeah, the idea is just make your business a priority. Uh, Make your purple cow your priority, right? And if it's, if you're like me and it's, uh, you know, the quality of training for a single player, then that has to be the priority over other things, right? Right. Even even if it's a team, even if it's more kids. Um, And so, yeah, that can be, that's kind of a challenge with COVID, right? Because there's going to be clubs, there's going to be uh, parents asking for you to place your priorities elsewhere. Um, but I would just encourage that coach to kind of stand firm by their principles. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great advice. And it's, I know down here, it's, you just stick into your guns. Yeah. And, uh, and I, it's the best way to, I mean, it's, it's the best way to do it. Cause, cause when you're clear with what you want, ultimately you're going to be putting yourself in the position to be, be you're more happy with who right. you're training, how you're spending your time. And, uh, no, man, that's, that's great advice. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think it was, um, maybe it was Warren Buffett. I, I saw, you know, it's, uh, he said, what I do is I say no a lot. 
Yeah. Um, and you know, for me, Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett isn't like the role model, especially for the type of business I run. Right. Um, but I, that's a great piece of advice is like, sometimes you have to say mm -hmm. no, uh, right. cause it means you're standing by something. Yeah. And I see, I see oftentimes too, when people start a business, like they'll have more free time, which means the distractions are going to be bigger. And then when there's an opportunity to do something else, the average person will just like look at it and go jump on it. But if they just say no, like what you're saying and what Buffett says, it's like you, you just get more focused on what you're doing. And I, I think just focus and being disciplined is a skill that people build over time. And it's impossible to be focused if you say yes to, to everything. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, yeah, you have to be really disciplined to shut down things that don't really align with what you want. And um, that's, that's been a probably huge reason why you're at where you're at now with your business. Cause you weren't jumping on 5,000 different idea trains over the past couple of years. You were, you had your head down, you're focused on helping kids one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Very cool, man. All right. Awesome. Well, first, uh, can you tell everyone, and I'm going to probably put it below where your video is, but what's your Instagram handle? Uh, the Instagram handle is train insight. Cool. Very easy to remember. And I'll put that yeah. right below. Um, so any other coaches who, who watch this, um, go, go check out, uh, Mason's page, see what he's doing there. And, uh, again, man, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your story. Uh, really my goal of this is to help coaches that are either starting or they are in business and, and learn from others that already have experience. Uh, so thank you so much, man, for, for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right.